Hey, it's Pastor Ben here from The Orchard in Emmett. I want to thank you for logging in and joining us for our online church service today. Uh, this weekend in our town, we sort of celebrated the future of our most recent graduating class from our high school. And uh, that's what we're talking about in our message today, actually, is what does our future look like? We're coming to the, close to the end of our Living in the Goodness of God series, where we've been going through the 23rd Psalm. It's a very famous, uh, well-known passage of scripture. And near the end of the psalm, uh, David writes that uh, there are good things ahead in his future. And so we're going to talk about that. Uh, I know our grads are looking forward to a lot of things in their future. And uh, with uh, God's perspective on our life, we can all look forward to good things in our future and not have to fear what is ahead of us. Uh, in, the, uh, in the very near future, we have definitely some things to look forward to as a church. Next Sunday evening, that would be May 31st, we're having our next Class 101 dinner. It's sort of our introduction to membership where we have a meal together and get to know each other a little bit and then just go through some materials about what our church is all about, what we believe, kind of how we're structured, how we're set up, uh, what our vision is, what our plan for accomplishing what God has called us to do here in our valley is, and to hopefully answer as many questions as we can that you might have about the orchard. So if you haven't been through our Class 101 yet, please RSVP for that. You can do that by uh, phone, email, text message, Facebook, whatever's convenient. That'll be at 5 o'clock at my home, and uh, we'd love to have as many of you there as possible. Uh, it's, it's no cost. We just need to know how many people are coming so we have enough materials and food. And then the very next Sunday, June 7th, we are having our first uh, gathered worship service since we uh, haven't been together during the coronavirus pandemic. We're going to be having that service at our normal time of 1030 Sunday morning out at our church property where, Lord willing, we will be building uh, a seven-day-a-week facility sometime here in the next couple of years. The address for that is roughly 2525 East Locust. Since there's no mail service there, it doesn't actually have an address, but uh, if you head east of Substation on Locust, uh, you can't miss it. We'll be on the right side all set up. And we're going to stick around after worship that day and enjoy celebrating our sixth year of ministry together. Uh, we didn't get to celebrate our birthday back in April when uh, we actually crossed that mark. So we're going to enjoy hanging out the afternoon of June 7th after church. So put that on your calendar. Plan to come and worship with us and uh, bring some people with you. I know there are lots of folks that are uh, anticipating being able to gather together as a group again in worship. Uh, even if they haven't been to church in a long time, this uh, time of isolation has kind of uh, reminded people of the value and importance of gathering together with others to, to worship God. So invite some people June 7th for our first service back together and our cookout afterward. And then June 14th will be our first Sunday morning back in Carberry Elementary. So big stuff coming up. May 31st, our Class 101 dinner at 5 o'clock in the evening at my house. Uh, June 7th out at the church property at uh, 1030 in the morning and then June 14th our regular 1030 service at Carberry so hope you'll be able to join us for those and uh, this morning especially if you're new with us we'd love to to hear from you to know that you were joining us in this online church service uh, like the video share it on your page uh, post a comment just so that we know that you were here and if you haven't liked our, our church page yet do that and if you haven't written a review yet we'd love to have you spend just a a minute or two writing down some of your thoughts about what the orchard has meant in your life. So again, welcome. We're glad that you've joined us this morning. And uh, we're going to, as we do every week, spend a little time singing, having worship through music. And then we'll dive in and unpack uh, this uh, sixth verse of Psalm 23. Let's pray before we worship in song. God, thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for this season of the year where uh, the trees and the flowers are in full bloom and there's some anticipation of uh, future growth that's coming. We thank you for the graduates of our school and for the futures that lie ahead of them. We ask your blessing on them and their families. And God, as we consider your word and what it has to say about our future as individuals and as a church body, God, we uh, invite you to uh, draw us closer to yourself, make us more like Jesus, give us your vision for our life and for our future. Uh, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship together.
thousand times I fail till your mercy remains. And should I stumble again, I'm caught in your grace. Everlasting, your light will shine when all else fades. Never ending, your glory goes beyond all fame. Today we're continuing in our series through Psalm chapter 23 that we've titled Living in the Goodness of God. And we're getting close to the end of the chapter and close to the end of our series here. We've only got one more week after uh, this week going through this verse. And so we're in verse 6 of Psalm 23, which again is one of the most well-known passages of Scripture in all of the Bible. And you know, when you, when you look at the heading of Psalm 23 in your Bibles, and in many Bible commentaries, it might say something along the lines of this psalm being about David's faith, about uh, David's perspective on his relationship with God. And really, that's 180 degrees the opposite of what this chapter is really about. This chapter of Psalm 23 is all about the goodness of God. And so we're going to start there just looking at uh, this chapter and reading through it again to see 
uh, that it is all about God's goodness. You know, a lot of times we talk about our faith in Jesus or, or our commitment to God, but really what's way more important than that is God's commitment to us, God's love for us, and how God views us, and how God takes care of us. And that's what this psalm is all about. And so let's read that together. Psalm 23, it'll be up here on the screen, and you can follow along. It says, The Lord is my shepherd. I have everything I need. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the right path for his namesake. Even when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you, Lord, are with me. Your rod and your staff comfort me. You prepare a banquet for me in front of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You'll notice that this psalm both opens and closes with talking about the Lord. At the beginning it says, the Lord is my shepherd. And in the very last verse it says, I will dwell in the house of the Lord. This chapter is all about God's goodness to us and living in his goodness. And so if you've missed any of the messages from these past few weeks uh, through Psalm 23 about God's goodness to us, I encourage you to go back uh, and watch those and listen to those. And you'll get some important information, some important encouragement about God's care for you and for your life. Uh, and so today we're going to look at this uh, very last verse. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. We're looking at this topic that I don't have to fear my future. And it's for this very reason what the Bible says. That goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's a good future to look forward to. And so if you have difficulty uh, often with the future, if as you think about and, and ponder the future of your life, if you're ever overcome with fear or anxiety or worry or concern or uncertainty or anxiety, God wants you to, to put that to rest. God doesn't want you to live with a fear of the future. And the good news is if you're a Christian, you don't have to fear your future. So we're going to get into the notes outline. Uh, it's up on our website and been posted here on this video as well as we do every week. The first reason that I don't need to fear my future is this, because God's goodness is watching over me. The Bible says right here, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Did you know that God in his goodness is always watching out for you? He's always paying attention to you. There's never been a second in your life where God was not intimately concerned with what's happening in your life. God created you to love you. He's a good God, and he is intimately involved in the details of your life. Now, I know a lot of people, they hear that and they think, well, how in the world could God be that focused on me? You know, I'm not that consequential of a person. In fact, I'm just, I'm one of seven and a half billion on the planet. How could God be that intimately involved in my life? Well, the God who spoke literally trillions of stars into existence in the universe doesn't have a problem keeping up on uh, seven and a half billion of us uh, who he created in his image here on planet Earth. So God can pay 100% attention to you and everything that's going on in your life and at the exact same time give all of his attention to every other person that he has created in his image. It blows our minds. We can't get our mind around it. Uh, but that is who God is. God is a big God. He knows all of your highs and lows. He knows all of your ups and downs. He knows all of your, your aches and pains. He knows all of your, your joys and your sorrows. God is intimately acquainted with your life. And the Bible says that he is a good God and that his goodness will follow us all the days of our life. Uh, what does that mean? Well, Psalm 145.20 is in your notes there. It says, the Lord watches over all who love him. God's goodness is always watching out for you and I. You're protected from thousands of things that you don't even recognize because God kept them from you and kept you from them. The Bible says, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days 
of my life. What does that mean? Well, obviously it doesn't mean that only good things are going to happen to us. That, that's simply not the case in the Bible. It doesn't uh, pretend that it is the case. There's a lot of bad things that happen to us in our life. In fact, David, the guy who wrote this book of Psalms, most of it, uh, he had some pretty bad things happen in his life. When the Bible says that goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, it doesn't mean that no bad will come into my life. It means that God can take anything bad that does come into my life and turn it around for something good. That's what God specializes in. And so surely goodness and mercy will follow me. It even follows after bad things that happen in our life because God can use them. He can turn them inside out and upside down and, and make good out of the bad things in our life as well. Romans 8, 28 is one of the greatest verses in all the scripture. We've looked at it a couple times in this series. It says, we know that all that happens to us is working for our good. It doesn't say it all is good, but it's working for our good. And this is a promise. If we love God and are fitting into his plans for us or living for his purposes, other translations say. And so notice that this promise isn't for everybody. This is for people who love God and are living for his purposes. If you have set your, your direction of your life away from God, then bad things aren't necessarily gonna turn around and end up for good. Uh, you could end up with bad following bad following bad. But if you are submitted to the Lordship of Jesus and you are living your life with him uh, as your captain, as your master, as your guide, as your Lord, and you love him, Bible says that anything bad happens in your life, he's going to use it. He's going to turn it around and make something good come out of it. Uh, now, of course, when you're going through a bad time in your life, it's really hard to see anything good coming out of it in the future, uh, especially if it's something really bad. It can pull us down, and that's really all we see, and, and we have difficulty finding hope in that moment. And that's one reason why it's so important to be a part of a family uh, of God, a, a church family where people can support and encourage and love one another through those dark seasons and remind us that there's going to be good that comes out of that. And, and it stinks that, that things are bad right now and, and I not only uh, feel bad for you, I feel bad with you, but I'm also going to do whatever I can to help make it better. And the most important thing I can do is point you to God's word. That's a reminder that he's going to turn whatever's bad in our life around for some good purpose in the end. And that's why we do our class 101, just to put another commercial in here, is so that we can stack hands to be that kind of a church family for one another. Uh, I had one of those seasons in my life uh, a few years ago where things had kind of turned bad and it was it was difficult to see uh, out of that darkness. It was actually 10 years ago this month that I kind of received that uh, proverbial pink slip from my last ministry job. That was actually the third time I had been released from a ministry in less than four years. And it was, uh, it was an experience that kind of pummeled my soul. And, and that was the the darkest point in my life, I think. And, and the next 18 months were, were about the worst uh, in my life. It was a struggle just to, to find uh, enough income to support my family. And as I continued to try and pursue this vision, this dream, this calling that I felt that I had in my life to plant a new church, uh, in that time I was told by uh, some church planting experts that that wasn't something that I was well suited for either. And that was probably even harder than the, the financial strain that we were under to, to feel like my calling from God ha had been removed or was dead. Well, I got, I got a 100% commission sales job, which is full of its own stresses, but I got fairly good at it. And so I was able to, to earn a better income and to be able to provide sufficient support for uh, providing for my family. Uh, but I hated the job. Uh, it involved a lot of phone calls, uh, a lot of meeting with people in their homes to try and explain our company's products and, and sell them to them. And then there were a lot of uh, customers who would cancel after I, I thought I had made a sale and, and earned some income, and that was stressful. There were those who, who complained about problems they were having after they had received our products. 
Then there was the pressure of management to always be working more and always be doing better in that sales job. And it was, uh, it was a rough time in my life. But as God always does, he took what to me was just a bad season of life and turned it around for good. God was preparing me to be able to endure all the ups and downs and the difficulties involved with church planting. A lot of those skills of, of networking with people and casting a vision and inviting people to participate uh, have been very useful in trying to establish an, a new church family. And so there are a lot of life situations that you're going to go through that you just don't see a redeeming value in. But the Bible promises us that if we love God and are living for His purposes in our life, He's going to take even those bad things and turn them around and use them for something good. So we don't need to fear those things that are coming in our life. We know that God's goodness is watching over me no matter what I go through. Number two in your notes, something we can learn from uh, this passage in Psalm 23, is that God's grace is working in me. Not only is God's goodness looking over me, God's grace is working within me. The Bible says that not just goodness, but mercy will follow me all the days of my life. What, what is mercy? Well, it's, it's the opposite side of the coin of God's grace. It's the same coin. They're just two different sides of it. Isaiah 60.10 says, this is God speaking, I will have mercy on you through my grace. When the Bible says that God's mercy and, and goodness are going to follow us all the days of my life, what's the difference between those things, God's goodness and his mercy? Well, God's goodness is when he gives us things that we don't deserve. It's his grace. It's just free gift from God. It's something that I don't deserve. And the reality is that I don't deserve any of the blessings in my life, and neither do you. In fact, this is one of my great pet peeves with advertising uh, in particular, but other people use this phrase frequently as well. Uh, a lot of companies will say, our product or our service is the blank you need, whatever it is uh, that they're selling, and it's what you deserve. Uh, anytime I hear that phrase, I think, on what scale, you know, what competition was this where, where I you know, earned this thing and, and I really deserve it because of my performance? Uh, it's kind of a ridiculous idea. Uh, most of the best things in our lives are simply the gracious gifts of God. They're things that we couldn't plan for, things that we couldn't earn on our own. We receive them uh, as gifts from God, which is what they are. Mercy is the other side of that same coin. Mercy is when I don't get what I actually do deserve. And there's plenty that I am uh, deserving of negative consequences for in my life. Uh, there are lots of times when I've been wrong, when I have sinned, when I have done something that was bad, when I've been self-centered, and I deserve punishment for all of those things. The Bible says that's those are a rejection of God's plan for my life. And so if God gave me everything that my life activities deserved, I wouldn't even be here right now. I would be uh, a smoldering pile of ash. And the same is true for you. Uh, when we don't get what we deserve, uh, that's a really good thing. And that's what mercy is. When God gives me good things that I don't deserve, that's his goodness. That's his grace. When God doesn't give me what my life, what my choices, what my behavior and actions do deserve, that's mercy. And David writes here, goodness, God's goodness, his grace, his gifts, and his mercy will follow me all the days of my life because God is good. I can expect both his provision and his pardon. That's what he offers me when I surrender my life to him. He gives me all kinds of good things I don't deserve, and he withholds all kinds of punishment that I would deserve. And so we can come to God with any time that, that we mess up, that we screw up, that we make a wrong choice, that we, that we make the wrong decision, that we do the wrong thing, because God's mercy is constantly following us. It's right there for us. And you don't have to be afraid of coming to God uh, with your mistakes because God's goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your life. Hebrews 4.16 says, We can come before God's throne, talking about prayer here, where we can receive mercy and grace, that same pair, to help us when we need it. And when you realize that God is, is never not 
good to you and God is never not merciful to you, uh, it changes your perspective on your life. You don't have to fear the future because God's goodness and mercy are right there following after you your whole life. You know, we don't know what's going to happen next week let alone next month or next year or the next 10 years or the rest of our life, but God does. God knows all of those things. And when I know that God's goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, I don't have to worry about those periods of time going forward because God uh, is going to bring good even out of the bad things in my life because his goodness is watching over me and his mercy is working in me. The Bible says that there is no condemnation for those of us who belong to Jesus. So I have nothing to worry about for my future. Fear comes when we believe we're going to be punished for something or if we don't believe that we're going to have something we need uh, when we get to a certain point in our life. And God is always good to us. God is going to provide all that we need. His mercy and goodness will follow us all the days of our lives. Here's a third reason we don't need to fear the future. Not only is God's goodness watching over me, God's grace is working in me. Number three, God's glory is waiting for me. This last line of Psalm 23 says, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's heaven. So not only goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life here on earth, but then I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. It gets even better because I get to go be with my Creator and with my Savior. Even after I've lived a life of great blessing here on earth, that's not the end. And so I will dwell in the house of the Lord. That's, that's a, a flourishing finish to this psalm, isn't it? Not only does God do all these good things for me that David is writing about in the first five and a half verses, he caps it off with, and I get to be in the presence of God forever when this life is over. That is a fantastic promise that God's glory is waiting for me and I don't have to fear what ultimately uh, is the destination of my life if I belong to Jesus. There's no more sorrow, no more suffering, no more sin, no more pain, no more pressure uh, in heaven will be at peace and at rest with uh, our Creator God. Now we get to see lots of glimpses of God's glory on earth during this life. You look around and there is beauty all around us, especially in the place that we are privileged to get to live in here in the Gem Valley. It's just a beautiful, beautiful place. The Bible says in Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God. Uh, my family and I were out camping a few weeks ago uh, with some friends and uh, as seems always happens in the middle of the night camping I had to go to the bathroom and so I kind of left our, our camping area and traipsed out into the the sage brush and as I was walking out there I was awestruck with just the expanse of the sky and the brightness and the literally innumerable stars it was it was gorgeous I had a moment of worship uh, in the middle of the wilderness, in the middle of the night, getting up to go to the bathroom because the heavens were declaring the glory of God. Uh, when you look at the stars, when you see a sunrise or a sunset, or you see uh, a full moon at night, uh, when you look at the, the varieties of plants and animals that God has created, it's, it's amazing the glory of God that is displayed in creation. Uh, we serve a very creative God. And when you see a waterfall, when you uh, see the mountain peaks that we have here in our state, it's just a reminder of the, the beauty and the power and the creativity and the glory of God. And the Bible says that God's glory can even be seen in you and me, even though we're, we're flawed creatures. Uh, you carry the image of God in you. In the Latin, that's called the imago Dei. There is inherent worth and value and beauty in every human being because by our very creation, we are reflecting the glory of our God and our Creator. And the Bible says that when we get to heaven, that we're going to get to see the full glory, the full beauty, the full uh, greatness of God. We can't see it all now. We get sneak peeks here and there, uh, but we're going to get a full exposure to God's glory 
in heaven. In Isaiah 63, it says, Lord, look upon us from heaven where you live in your holiness and glory. And 1 Corinthians 2, 9 says, No eye has ever seen, no ear has heard, nor mind has ever imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. We're going to get to to see God's glory in its fullness. And if you've ever seen anything on this earth that was just awe-inspiring, breathtaking, moving, you haven't seen anything yet. Those were just a taste. Those were just an appetizer of the glory of God to be revealed in heaven. God's glory is waiting for us to be a part of and to experience in its fullness. Romans 9.23 says this, God wanted to reveal his abundant glory, which was poured out on us. That's you and me. We've been recipients of it. We who are the objects of his mercy and whom he has prepared in advance, is talking about us, his people, to receive his glory. We're going to get to experience God's glory in its fullness. So these are three very important things that uh, this psalmist is referring to, that God's goodness and mercy will follow us all the days of our lives and that we'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. God's goodness is always watching over me. God's grace is always working in me, and God's glory is waiting for me. So what does that mean for a Monday morning? You know, that's that's a good three-point sermon for Sunday. It, it sounds good. It's, it's right from the Bible. But what does that mean for the rest of my life, uh, Monday through Saturday? Well, let me give you three implications for how these truths from Psalm 23 about God's goodness and mercy in the future that he has for me uh, can, can affect my daily life. This is how you live fully, and this is how you live fearlessly. Number one, stay grateful and generous because God is so good to me. We've talked about this before in this series, that one of the most important things we can do as a result of God's goodness to us that this whole psalm uh, explains and uh, describes is that God has been so generous with me, he calls me to be generous to others with my life. He calls me to be grateful to him for his goodness in my life. Psalm 118, 29 says, Give thanks continually to our Lord because he is so good and because his mercy never will run out. There's another verse that talks about God's goodness and his mercy to us. So I need to be grateful to God for his goodness and his uh, generosity because he had been so good to me. Hebrews 12, 28 says, we have been given possession of an unshakable kingdom. This is the kingdom of God that we get to be a part of uh, as believers, as Christians. And it's unshakable. Uh, you can't lose it. You're not going to fall out of God's family. Therefore, let us be grateful and use our gratitude to worship God in the way that pleases him with reverence and in awe. That's something we need to develop as a daily habit of consciously being grateful to God for everything that he has done in us and through us and for us and around us in the world. We need to be grateful. And that's how we get our minds off of any fear that we might have about the future. We recognize God's goodness to us and we're grateful for it. Uh, and the second response is generosity. God says, I want you to pass on the goodness that you have received from me. And so as God is generous with us, we can be generous with the people around us in our life. Matthew 10, 8, Jesus says, you have been treated generously by God. So live generously. Give as freely as you have received. I've mentioned it before multiple times that that gratitude and generosity are a couple of the healthiest things that a human being can do for their own mental well-being. People who are generous and who are grateful, who are thankful, and who are giving are much more healthy socially and emotionally and mentally and psychologically than those who aren't. And the more generous we are and the more grateful we are, the less fearful we're going to be. This is a demonstrated link between these two things. Psalm 112, verses 5 through 9, says, Good will come to him. I want to pause right there. How many of us want good to come to us in our lives? You probably don't know anyone who would, who would say no to that offer. Would you like goodness in your life? 
here's what the Bible says uh, we can do to, to have that. Good will come to him who is generous. Such people lend freely. Goodness comes to those who lend openly and freely. You know, hey, you need you need your car to borrow. You can you can take mine. You need some place to stay. Uh, you can crash at my place. You need some money for food. Uh, here, here's some money for food. You need a babysitter? Let me help you out with that. You need a ride to the doctor? I'd be more than happy to take you. You need me to, to bring a meal because somebody in your family is sick? I'm happy to do that as well. Generosity in every area of our life, not just our money, but our time, our energy, uh, our thought, our praise, our compliments. We need to be generous with our words with people. The Bible says, good will come to him who is generous. Such people lend freely and conduct their affairs honestly. They will never be shaken. They don't fear bad news because they trust the Lord to care for them. They are confident and fearless. This would be a great passage for you to memorize. They're confident and fearless in facing their opposition. If you ever feel opposition in your life, the Bible says, be generous and that will that will relieve the pressure of your opposition. Because they give generously to those in need, they will have influence and honor. I need to be generous, I need to be grateful. That will allow me to, to be reminded of, to remember, to experience God's goodness in my life even more as I pursue gratefulness and generosity. Secondly, uh, I need to be gracious to everyone because God is gracious to me. Not only do I need to be grateful and be generous and sharing, uh, but to be gracious. Ephesians 4.32 says, be gracious and merciful to everyone and forgive others just as God has forgiven you because of Christ. How much slack has God cut you in your life? How many things have you done in your life that you just really deserve to be, to be whacked for? And how much has God extended grace to you in those things? There are people in your life who you probably have not been quite as gracious with. Who is there in your life that you need to let off the hook? That you need to just uh, be gracious with? Who you need to forgive? Who you need to wipe the slate clean with and give a fresh start? God was gracious to me. I've been forgiven. Therefore, I want to be gracious and forgiving to the people around me and not uh, keep them on the line and, and hold grudges against them. 1 John 4.18 says, There is no fear in love. Instead, perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. Fear means that I don't believe that God has forgiven me or that God is going to continue to be good to me and be gracious to me. And every time we, we're reminded of that, we remember and invite God's love into the front door of our life, fear goes out the back door because those two things can't reside inside of us at the same time. And so we need to be gracious to everyone because God has been so gracious to us. We need to remember his goodness and his grace to us. Here's a way that you can know that somebody doesn't really understand, uh, hasn't really fully embraced and comprehended God's grace in their own life, and that is because they're not gracious to the people around them. Uh, you might say that ungracious people are ungraced people. They haven't received and welcomed into their heart and soul the grace of God and understand what that means for them and by extension what that means for the people around them. They don't realize how much they've been forgiven and, and they carry around guilt and fear of punishment for those things and they don't feel forgiven, they don't feel uh, clean, they feel ashamed and they want everybody else to feel the same way too. And so they hold things over people's heads. But if I remember how good God has been to me, if I remember God's grace and God's forgiveness, then I'm going to be more likely to be gracious to others, to cut them some slack, to let some things slide. And so anytime you see somebody who's really ungracious uh, and who uh, is just very bitter and brittle, uh, you can be sure that they're walking around with a ton of guilt. They haven't embraced and received and understood God's grace that's available to them. And really they're in a place uh, of pain and suffering. 
you maybe have a, a, a mom or a dad or a, or a mother-in-law or a friend or a neighbor or you know, a brother or sister who can't let anybody off the hook. They're just always calling people on their stuff and, and don't let them forget it and they're holding it over their head. Those people are, are ultimately not very happy and they have their own fears about the future because they know that they've done wrong and they're just waiting for, for God to, to whack them a good one too. They have not experienced God's goodness. And so I want to stay grateful and generous with the people around me. I want to be gracious because of how good God has been to me. Here's the third and last thing that we can practically do to be reminded of and to experience more fully uh, the goodness and mercy of God in the future. To live my life for God's glory because he's going to share his glory with me. We, we live for God's glory. We, we live to, to point people towards God and his goodness and his beauty and his grace and his generosity uh, because he's going to share his goodness with us for all of eternity. That's what the Bible says. What does that mean practically? How do I live for God's glory in my family? How do I live for God's glory in my neighborhood or, or where I work? Uh, in my community. Here's what Jesus said about that in Matthew 5. He says, let your light shine before others so they may see your good works. That's the key. Your good works, good things that you do for others and give glory to your father who is in heaven. When you do your best to live for God, to do good things for others in the name of Jesus, that brings glory to God. That's what Jesus said. And it it reminds you, it opens you up to an experience of God's grace and goodness in your life uh, like you have not never felt before. And it extends God's glory and grace and goodness into the lives of others around you. 1 Peter 1.3 is the last verse in your outline. It says, God in his divine power has given us everything we need for living a godly life. And the power is given to us through knowing Jesus. And he has called us to share in his own goodness and glory. The more we walk with Jesus in this life, the more we get to experience and share in the goodness of God and in his glory and his beauty and his greatness. And when you think about your future, whether it's you know, the next six months or the next year or the next five or ten years, what comes to mind? What kind of feelings do you have as you think about your future? Is it filled with, with doubt and, and confusion and, and worry and fear and anxiety? Well, that means you're not focused on the goodness of God the way he wants you to. Psalm 23 says, Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. It's amazing how different you feel about life when you're living in the goodness of God. You begin to live from the goodness of God in your life. It makes your experience of life uh, so much better. There's going to be lots of things that happen in your life that aren't good, that you can't explain, that you wish weren't there, but you could still face them confidently because you know God's going to turn them around and use them for something good in your life. And God's goodness and mercy are going to be right there following you all the days of your life. And you, you get to dwell in the house of the Lord forever when this life is over. All those things are true when you make Jesus your good shepherd. Have you done that yet? Have you surrendered your life to Jesus, the Good Shepherd? Have you invited him to take uh, the messed up leftovers of trying to run your own life, to, to take away your rebellion of refusing to do things the way that you know your Creator God wants you to do them? Have you surrendered and, and received God's free gift of grace and forgiveness that he demonstrated in, in Jesus' death and resurrection? You can do that today. The Bible says when we're ready to, to turn our lives over to God, to surrender ourselves to Jesus and experience his goodness and mercy all the days of our life, that we, we bury our old life in baptism, that we're raised up out of that water as a brand new creature, as a, a member of the family of God, a child of God who's going to dwell in the house of the Lord 
forever. I want to invite you today to do business with God, if you haven't, to surrender your life to Him and to, to bury the old life and start fresh. We would love to hear from you if that's where you're at in your life. We would love to share the journey of living in the goodness of God with you here in the orchard. Please reach out to us, send us a Facebook message, send us a text, an email, uh, whatever it might be, just so we can begin to get to know you so that we can share this journey of life together as we live in the goodness of God. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the encouragement of your word, that for those of us who love you, have submitted our lives to you, and are looking to to live for your glory, that your goodness and mercy are with us every day of our life, and that we're going to dwell with you in your glory forever at the end of this life. And we thank you for that encouragement. Help us to cooperate with the leading of your spirit, to be grateful and generous and gracious, and to do good works that will point others to you. God, we know that the best way to live life is the way that you've called us to. We thank you for forgiving us when we fall short and for walking through our lives with us and for giving us the hope of heaven with you forever. God, for those who haven't stepped over the line of faith and surrendered their lives to you, I ask that you would continue drawing them and God, that you would bless the Orchard Christian Church here in Emmett with the, the privilege of immersing new believers into your family and sharing life with them. God, we want to be your people. We want to live in your goodness. We want to live from your goodness. And we want to share your goodness with this community. We thank you for the privilege of getting to do that. And we invite you to increase our faith in you, increase our good works, and God, increase the harvest of those who are surrendering their lives to you. We thank you for the privilege of being on mission with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Again, thanks for joining us in The Orchard Online today. Uh, please do uh, like and share this video. Uh, like and share our page, write us a review. Remember, May 31st at 5 in the evening is our Class 101 dinner. Put that on your calendar, RSVP for that. We'll get you uh, whatever information you need in terms of directions. June 7th at 10.30 in the morning at 2525 East Locust for our first worship gathering followed by our birthday cookout. And then June 14th at 10.30 at Carberry Elementary for our first service back together in our normal location. Thanks for being with us. Uh, God bless you, and may you live in his goodness this week.